Absolutely. Let me share. Um... So guys, this is Professor Puyan Jamshedi, uh, as you know, and as I had announced. And um, uh, Puyan does exciting work in several fields of AI, uh, several topics of AI. Uh, adversarial learning is one of them. And I think that's what he's going to focus on today. Um, it's a very exciting project uh, uh, and, and, and has students working on that too. Great. Um, can you, I hope you can hear me well, right? Yes. And you, do you see the screen? Yeah, we do. Great, great. Um, thanks, Amit. Um, thanks for, for the introduction and um, um, hi, everybody. <laughs> nice uh, seeing you. Yeah, um, thanks for turning on your camera. At least in, in my class, uh, I guess students do not turn on their camera. It's difficult. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't see the reason for good reason for hesitancy, but that's some, some don't. And uh, what would you do? Would you hide your face if you're in a class? Yeah, I don't know. Like I ask uh, students in, uh, in my class, um, it's um, probably um, because they're shy or something. Um, it's every time I, I have to ask and like out of 40, 50 students, only like a couple of them will turn on their camera. <laughs> so. Uh. Okay, um, so um, let's uh, start. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, this work here um, called Athena is a framework um, for uh, defending uh, machine learning system. Um, this is the um, joint work uh, with several other people. Um, um, this work is led by my students, Ying, um, Ying Meng um, now is a third year PhD student um, and her research is mainly on adversarial ML. Um, in this research, um, Jianhai also helped a lot um, and um, it's uh, in collaboration with uh, Biplov, uh, Forrest and uh, Jason, um, who you know, um, colleagues um, in our department. And um, I was lucky to present uh, on behalf of this fantastic group. I think I can skip this. Um, I had a little bit of a slide um, about my group, but let's jump um, into the main topic. Um, so uh, this topic of adversarial ML um, is the intersection of cybersecurity and machine learning. Um, and these days, um, due to the importance of uh, deep learning or deep neural network, you know that um, the key is that uh, these type of systems are deployed widely. Um, you could um, build a machine learning system using different types of uh, learning algorithm, different types of models, uh, but the majority of them um, stay at the research um, and um, re in the research lab. But um, these days, um, deep learning systems um, got their way um, and uh, has been used a lot uh, and are deployed widely uh, in our societies. So it's important to um, know their security threats, um, to, um, to identify the security threats that they have and find a way to make them more secure. Um, but the first step is, is to identify these security gaps. And um, that's uh, all about adversarial examples people have shown even by adding a, a small perturbation um, to the input data. You can, for example, make um, a panda um, as a gibbon. This is what uh, the model identifies. Um, this noise, by the way, is um, generated 
uh, using um, the cost function uh, of the uh, model. So this theta is the uh, model parameters, um, x is the input, y is the label, and um, this is the gradient of this uh, cost function with respect to uh, the input, and this is um, how the noise was generated. This noise is uh, a small noise uh, in terms of magnitude, um, but it is uh, important to emphasize that this is not a random noise. Um, so it's uh, uh, targeted noise, uh, but for us, this um, image, this input after perturbation is still a panda, the same thing, but the model um, got confused uh, and it classifies it differently. And there are like different uh, formal definition of um, adversarial examples from the mathematical point of view. Um, maybe it's um, good to um, talk about this. Um, um, to uh, set the first thing very clear. Um, so if we have a model, like for example, let's say uh, we call it H, um, this is the model uh, and theta is the parameters of, of this model, okay? Um, and here uh, also throughout this lecture, um, I um, imagine that we have an input um, and after adding a perturbation, a small perturbation, uh, we get X prime. So this X prime um, is a perturbed uh, input. Like you could consider this as X prime, this as a X, this is as a, a small noise, right? Um, so um, adversarial example um, traditionally has been defined as uh, those input where the model uh, identify this as, uh, as a class, which is different than the original class. So in this case, C is the ground truth data. We here assume that the, um, the original, the, um, the input um, basically um, is correctly. So here we assume explicitly that the model uh, classify X correctly, um, exactly to, uh, according to the correct class. So this is definition uh, because you know that there are some examples that by default, even without perturbation, model made mistake on these examples, right? Um, and it is important to distinguish these. Here, we explicitly assume that um, and like this is a uh, definition, um, although there are multiple other definitions that I'm going to talk about it, but here we assume that the, um, the adversarial examples are those that the uh, model didn't make mistake uh, for the unperturbed input but made mistake for the perturbed input, right? Um, because you could also define adversarial examples where simply um, the, um, this, is, this is different, the label that has been identified by the perturbed uh, input is simply different than the, uh, the one um, with the original input, right? Um, and here we explicitly assume that we don't distinguish between those um, um, examples that has been classified correctly uh, before perturbation, right? Um, but here let's, to be clear, to be very precise, let's assume that the SIA examples are the ones that um, correctly was classified by the model. So the model is good enough, um, uh, but got confused after we, uh, we perturb this um, inputs um, data, okay? Um, beyond this uh, panda, there are like some other uh, 
work um, showing like even you could uh, trick the model by rotation. Uh, also, some people show that um, you could uh, 3D uh, print some objects and make the model confused. Um, so it's not uh, only digital uh, input, but also could be 3D printed ones as well. But the rotation by itself uh, won't uh, do it, right? You have to add um, a specific, uh, you know, noise uh, that fools the system. Am I right? So in this case, <coughs> um, as far as I remember, this work they showed that um, by rotation and translation, you could um, confuse the model. You could trick the model without even adding any noise. Huh. Um, but um, yeah, this is, as far as I remember, this was um, only showing with rotation and translation. Um, in in that case, yeah, but in that case, you can argue that maybe the training was itself not sufficient. I mean, could be, um, uh, but um, in, in their work, they show that um, um, they sufficiently trained the model. I mean, you could say okay maybe add more data yeah that's right but um but again this is um the state of the art type of model um mm -hmm. that uh, people uh, are using in practice right for doing real work um this is this is the assumption right mm -hmm. um so the, the the model that people has uh, have been widely using for doing real stuff and uh, they were able to show that um, they, are, uh, they could uh, generate some examples that confuse the model or uh, oh, uh, Dr. Jamshidi, if you yes. go back to the previous slide, um, like rotation of a truck to an upside down truck. Now, when you're talking about deployment in the real world, mm -hmm. uh, the nature of augmentation of the initial image or perturbation can get pretty ridiculous. So if the end goal is uh, deployment in the real world, where do you stop by saying that, okay, in the training data, I'm going to include things that are realistically possible as uh, augmentations of the input image instead of flipping it on its backside, right? Um, uh, that's, that's right, that's a good question. Um, Yes, some of these perturbation may seem impossible, but couldn't you imagine that, like, you you might have a man in the middle, you you have a self-driving car, uh, and like you don't even perturb the object it sees, but you put a man in the middle to like do this transformation somewhere on uh, on the network, like after, uh, the, like it is feed fed into the camera, uh, you know, until it reaches um, the, um, the model that wants to decide uh, the steering, right, um, in, uh, on the car. Um, so you do not need to necessarily, so this uh, security hole could be like uh, put uh, anywhere, uh, right? Does it make sense? Yeah, it does. It does. Thank you. Sure. And also um, people, um, some colleagues at CMU showing like you could um, wear some glasses and uh, trick um, classifier that used for, you know, um, verifying who, who the person is. And also beyond images by um, some hidden voice command uh, that are not uh, possible to hear it, but was able to trick um, something like Alexa. Um, and also people have used it in um, not only um, in the context of classifiers, um, uh, in the context of uh, um, gener general purpose classifier, but also in terms of right, reinforcement learning and LLP, um, you could also do the same. Uh, generating some adversarial example and uh, forcing the model to be uh, to be tricked. Um, and the question is that should we really worried about these situations? Um, the answer might be like maybe not in these scenarios, these artificial scenarios, 
But when it comes to um, human lives, uh, yeah, we should uh, we should really be worried about. Um, we should um, have uh, the means, um, first of all, to um, identify these security gaps, um, security holes, and uh, and find a way to protect these systems, these machine learning systems, using um, large defense mechanisms that uh, we are able to develop, and and so on. And um, in in this line of research, uh, there. Are um, different directions. Um, some people um, focus on like generating, developing new uh, attack mechanisms. Um, like, uh, for example, the earlier work that I mentioned, um, some researchers, some work focus on building defense mechanisms, right? How to protect the system. Um, both um, aiming uh, to make the system more resilient, more robust against these uh, adversarial attacks, right? So um, both directions are important. Um, this research that I'm going to present is more on the defense side, um, is, a, is a defense mechanism that I'm going to talk about it. Now the question is that where do adversary examples come from? Um, let's build up some uh, mathematical definition. Let's assume that we have a distribution uh, of some input data, um, like we have some examples showing palm trees, some uh, examples showing oranges and chimpanzee. And then like we, we build a model, um, uh, neural network or something, um, and then uh, we choose a particular example um, using a specific parameter uh, of the model. Yeah, this um, particular example has been classified incorrectly, but maybe if we train it more, if we like use a different um, uh, mechanism for training, um, this uh, classify this model becomes better and classified uh, correctly, right? Um, so the whole goal of uh, machine learning or um, supervised machine learning in particular is to find um, best parameters um, that um, make this loss function um, as small as possible um, on all uh, input data, right? Um, so the goal is to find these uh, such parameters um, to, uh, to make this uh, expected loss as, as small as possible uh, in practice, right? Um, so this is the goal of um, supervised uh, ML. Um, as By the way, supervised, you already know that. Call it supervised because we, you see why here. So you assume that you have the label for, for the inputs. Um, and we use a method like uh, gradient descent uh, version of it uh, in order to uh, optimize and find such parameters. Uh, those who took um, 585 um, or um, like um, 580, um, we already discussed um, these um, optimization methods. Um, on the other hand, um, the goal of the adversary is different. Um, the adversary wants to, first of all, maximize this loss, uh, making the model to do poorly, uh, given uh, the same input and uh, output, but perturbing the input slightly in a way that nobody recognizes it. And that's why we put a constraint that the uh, LP norm of this uh, perturbation is uh, as small as possible because if it is uh, the magnitude of this noise is large, everybody sees that yes, this input has been perturbed, so it's easy to identify. And that's why you see this constraint uh, on the um, perturbations. Um, 
And this um, uh, area is, um, is a, a crowded area. Many people working on this, uh, publishing some exciting work. Um, and if you want to know more about, I would probably suggest this paper having some very good insights um, about uh, this direction. But let's, um, let's jump in uh, to Athena. Um, Athena is a framework for defending machine learning systems against adversarial attacks. Um, and it is based on some very simple insight. Uh, and I will start talking about this insight because these insights are more important than um, the results. Um, so uh, I would like to clarify these insights first. Um, and if we get time, we talk about the results. Um, so the key insight is, um, is that, and previously people have shown that like, um, if you transform an input um, and you know that like, we have like so many different transformations, right? Mathematically, we have infinite number of uh, possible way that you can transform the input data. Um, x to x prime right so like if you have a transformations you could transform your input in many different way and there are, is a function right is a function um, that um, change your uh, input um, um, to um, to transform it to some other inputs right um, for example, rotation is one of those uh, transformations. And people have shown it that um, doing this transformation, um, you get rid of some of these uh, adversarial attacks, meaning that uh, like the model might have been tricked after you add some perturbations to the input, in this case, the model recognized this as nine after you add some carefully, uh, careful uh, perturbations, right? So these are not random again, these are some carefully crafted perturbations and model has been tricked. Uh, but after doing this transformation, the model uh, identifies this correctly. And the key reason is, uh, is that, um, if you think about it, um, like the adversary uh, did the optimization in order to find uh, these small perturbations by flipping, uh, they were mislocated. So they don't have this uh, effectiveness as they had before. Um, so in this case, it is more likely to, um, to um, to label this input correctly uh, as a result, even if um, this is perturbed in terms of magnitude the same way as this one, like both of them um, perturbed in the same magnitude, right? So if you calculate the, uh, the amount of perturbation in this case, and in this case, they are exactly the same amount in terms of magnitude of perturbations but where did you put them are, are different, right? Is, is this clear? So, so where do you put them? Is there any, um, uh, is, is that primarily statistical choice or is it, uh, there is any scope of uh, uh, the real world interpretation? Uh, what I mean is um, you can take a nine and you can flip it and it looks like six. And there is a, uh, you know, I guess, uh, you know, that's a real world thing. While you can take some other number and you flip it um, and it doesn't look like any other number. Yeah, that's, that, that's a very good question, right? So here we assume that we don't want to change the semantic of, of this, right? So we assume that um, when Philippe, uh, even a six, um, it should be still six, not nine. We, did not mean to change the semantic of of uh, of this, right? Um, or in a way, um, we will we deal with the situation where 
uh, by flipping or um, doing these transformations, um, the semantics of this should not change. Or mathematically speaking, we want the, um, the class of X would be the same exactly as class of X prime, right? Um, so this is our assumption because as you perfectly mentioned in the case of six to nine, when you flip it, yes. Uh, but we assume that like um, we don't want to purposefully change the semantic of these inputs. This is, this is our um, assumption after, after um, sorry, after, yeah, in this case, like, or more explicitly, the semantic of X is the same as T of X, right? So after applying transformation to the input, the class would not vary. We, we preserve the semantic um, as a result. In this particular example, you have, uh, what does this 0.4 mean? It's, is it the probability of predicting seven? Which, which one? Oh, um, yes. So this is um, the probability of a seven B D because you know that these classifier are probabilistic classifier. So they assign probability to each um, to each class and you pick up the um, highest probability as the um, um, as the class that has been identified or labeled by this model. So in this case, four, 0 0.4 was the class seven. Uh, on the other hand, was the class that has the highest probability, right? And this right. probability was 56, 0 0.5649. Okay, uh, zero point four isn't very high, but the second question is that yeah. you the um, in the first part the perturbation was by some delta, right? And right. in the second part the perturbation was a rotation, and uh, in, the, in the second part we we simply rotated like we simply rotated perturb input so. There's no change in terms of perturbation, right? Um, but uh, so if you actually measure the difference in pixel values, which is what delta measures, or in sine gradient, or whatever that perturbation is, there actually is a change, right, between the rotated. Um, in a in a previous slide, you showed the delta to be say negative of the or sine gradient, the sine of the gradient, mm -hmm. whatever value you choose. If you measure that specific quantity between uh, picture one and three, is going to be different from delta. That's right. That's right. So and that's why I mentioned in this case, uh, we do not want to assume that um, we. Um, where is this? Um, we do not want to assume that uh, we have. Um, after uh, applying T, <coughs> we change the semantic. So okay. we explicitly we don't want to measure the uh, perturbation um, after we apply the transformation in this case, or more explicitly, um, <coughs> So in this case, more explicitly, we, we do not want to measure um, the, where is this? The difference between um, X and um, T of X. I mean, um, even though you could do that, but uh, <coughs> do not want to do that, right? So, uh in um in our scenario um uh, we we assume that um we are still interested in in the original x so we have a um 
uh, inverse of transformation that we could retrieve the original input as a result. And we only fit this transform input for the sake of the model itself, right? Um, does it make okay. sense? So uh, by semantics preserving transformation, you mean a transformation mathematically that has an inverse? Yes, right? yeah, exactly. I have a small question in regards to um, the images here. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so I'm sorry to be having to ask a menial question, but when I'm actually comparing these images very closely, um, I notice that the pixels actually are not equal to each other. Um, for example, the, the red square you have on the left in the second image here is two pixels vertical. And in the picture on the third image, it's actually two pixels horizontal. Is this because of a uh, an error in interpolation when you guys are rotating the image and you have to re-render it? Because it seems like the pixels are just, um, the, the, the perturbations you have in the second image do not equal the perturbations on the right image. Um, some pixels are larger. It, it, it be equal. If it's not, maybe um, as far as I can see, they are equal, right? Um, there is a small difference like between this and this one, uh, but maybe this this part this side has been cutted, right? So this this one. This part, I see. Right? But but essentially they they supposed to be exactly the same the same sort of uh, perturbation. Um, I see what he's saying though. I see it as if it's one eighty, wouldn't it still be vertical and it's horizontal now? Yeah, that's what I mean. It's like um, yeah, I, I was wondering well, if the perturbation the red one, yeah. It's, it's horizontal in one and vertical in the other. Yeah, um, like um, maybe Ying, if she was here, she could answer, but the assumption here is that like simply you rotate it, right? So like um, after, um, if this, this has been just rotation, like there shouldn't be any difference in terms of uh, perturbation in these two images. Um, I see. I was just wondering if these um, little changes in the pixel values actually changed the uh, the classification result as we see here. Right. And uh, it wasn't actually just- so it was either like by mistake or like she cropped it uh, when she put it here, uh, but they supposed to be exactly the same, the same um, per the input. Um, All right, I got it. Thank you for, thank you. Sure, yeah, good catch. So, um, so that was uh, one transformation, but again, like there are multiple different transformation and this like idea of transformation has been out there previously, right? Um, but when we consider many different transformations, we find out about some interesting insights. Um, so let's, uh, let's clarify what you see in this image. Um, here um, on the rows, you see a bunch of different transformations, right? So compress, denoising, filter, geometric, and so on. Here are the inputs, um, okay? And uh, on the Y, on the columns, you see different attacks like FGSM, BIM, uh, deep full and so on. So like on uh, column, uh, you see different uh, attacks. And uh, if you look at each of these transformations, right? Um, so um, say, um, first of all, first of all, like after, after adding after attacking the uh, the, uh, the examples, after generating the adversarial example, the model has been treated in all cases. So you see here, um, the generated label is nine, eight, nine, two, nine, 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 meaning showing that the model has been treated in all cases all scenarios, right? Um, 
But after we apply transformations from row number um, three um, here, um, also here and all the way down to here, um, you see different things. First of all, there are some transformation that do really well, right? For example, in compress, um, it was only tricked uh, in one pixel, which is somehow a strong attack, uh, right? Uh, but it was able to recover the true label in other cases. Denoising the same way, it, but it was tricked on um, not one pixel, but on one uh, on BIM. There are some weaker transformation like geometric transformation that has been tricked in like several different um, attacks was able to recover few uh, few cases, right? Um, the same way as noise and interesting, you see that it was able to recover this one pixel where this strong compression was not able to, or also rotation as well, right? Um, so few insight. First of all, um, the effectiveness of these transformations varies of, from, uh, from transformation to transformation. So in terms of effectiveness, they have, uh, it varies. And also they tend to complement each other, meaning that, um, like some of them were failed in few, which was able to be recovered correctly in some other transfer with some other transformation. So they have this complementary aspect that they complement each other. So this insight uh, basically um, uh, the Athena essentially is based on this insight. And we thought, okay, if we put them together as an ensemble model, um, then it could be a potential strong defense mechanism um, in order to defend um, machine learning systems, right? So that's that's a key insight of, uh, of our approach um, is uh, exploiting this complementary aspect of transformations and so on. Um, let me skip this, um, maybe um, to, to only like uh, explain important points. Um, also, we noticed diversity of, uh, of transformations matters, uh, meaning that if we put together uh, more diverse uh, transformations, right? Because like, again, the space of uh, possible mathematical transformations are huge, right? Infinite. Um, and you could have like uh, more, you could have homogeneous transformation, you could have heterogeneous transformation, right? Um, in this case, we did one like very um, limited experiment um, where we put together a uh, different um, version of an ensemble uh, using um, a diverse um, set of transformation. And uh, this red uh, using um, homogeneous, like only shift, different version of shift, right? Um, different degree of shift. Um, when we put together different degree of shift as a transformation, right? Uh, we noticed that um, if we do that, um, diverse in diverse case where we put together diverse set of transformation, we were able to decrease the error rate, or on the other hand, we were able to get a more robust model as a result. Um, here, we varied the number of weak differences um, um, meaning that the number of weak defenses here explicitly means that the number of members inside the ensembles. Um, also, we compare it with PGD-ADT, which is a, um, uh, a state-of-the-art defense mechanism. And you see that uh, we were able to, um, to outperform this uh, strong uh, defense, um, this adversarial training defense, uh, if we uh, put together a diverse set of um, transformations. 
So this was interesting and more explicit in this case, PGD ADT uses PGD as a um, inner, as an attacker in an inner optimization loop uh, where adversarial training works um, um, overall. So that was, that was a good, um, good result. Um, let's uh, skip this and let's, um, let me explain um, at the framework level uh, how it works. Um, so here um, we have a terminology we call weak defense. By weak defense, we mean this uh, individual model that we have built uh, based on these uh, transformations. Um, explicitly um, by weak defense, we mean a model that instead of training on the original input, we trained on the perturbed, uh, on the transformed input. So imagine that for each transformation, we, uh, we train the model on the transformed input. Um, so let's imagine that for like, for example, if you have a rotation, we train the model on the rotated images. Um, and the key idea is that like, um, if we don't do this, if we don't explicitly train this, uh, uh, because again, this is referring back to the case that we did not want intentionally to change the semantic of the, uh, uh, of the input after transformation. We wanted to be the exact class um, after we, uh, we do the transformation in this scenario. We wanted to exploit this transformation only as a defense mechanism uh, to, um, to basically um, get rid of the efficiency of these perturbations. Um, so uh, we use a classifier for doing this and we, we, uh, we get a trained model uh, at the ensemble level, um, so we put together several different uh, of these models uh, after transformations here, like um, we have an input data, um, some, and like here what happens is that each transformation does their task and the label is generated based on these weak defenses, we ask each weak defense, what do you think, what is this um, input? And then they generate some label. So some, some of them, they correctly classify, some of them may, may have been tricked as a result. And then we have ensemble strategy that determine the, the um, outcome, meaning that like uh, could be a majority voting, could be, um, any ensemble strategy that say, hey, like what is the correct label for um, correct label for uh, for this input? And um, if this is majority voting, like we have two seven one nine, so the output is seven. Okay, um, but you already know that like we could have different ensemble strategy. Um, majority voting is not the only one. Is this clear how framework work? Do you have any question? Okay, um, so let's talk about evaluation, some results. Um, the evaluation we, um, we have done in different scenario um, in zero knowledge where um, the attacker doesn't know the existence of a defense, doesn't know uh, detail of the weak defense and ensemble strategy, but know the um, parameters of the target model. Uh, black box, uh, we have some other constraints, um, does know about the existence, but doesn't know the parameters of the model. Gray box um, has much more knowledge and in white box does know pretty much anything about the, the system and the model, um, including the weak defenses, um, classifier and everything. Um, 
And uh, I'm going to talk about um, some of these, um, but I will skip some of, some of them, uh, given the limited time that we have. Um, so um, let's start by um, zero knowledge. Um, here you see uh, a specific attack, FGSM, um, a specific model that we have used and uh, particular data set, C400. Um, on the x-axis, you see FGSM with different magnitude of perturbation. As you go to the right, um, the attack uh, generated by this attacker is a lot more stronger. And you see here, like the error rate is quite large, more than 80% for, um, for the original model. Um, so this is the error rate uh, generated. Um, so this amount of around 90% of the uh, input has been classified incorrectly by the model. Um, the same for um, different value for different magnitude of perturbations. Um, so what you see here, um, we instantiated different version of Athena with different uh, ensemble strategy. Um, for example, MV is the majority voting. Um, or is the case where we randomly select uh, one of these weak defenses and so on. Um, but there are these four are different in instantiation of uh, of Athena. Um, your definition and the detail you can find it in a paper. Um, also, we compared with PGD, ADT, and randomized small thing, which are um, two important uh, state of the art defense mechanism uh, that we compared. Um, and the result was interesting. So, um, and you see that. Um, First of all, uh, we were able to um, get a better robustness so, or decrease the error rate quite considerably in uh, almost all cases, uh, comparing with the undefended uh, model. So this gap uh, and the uh, accuracy of the robustness of different version of Athena varied, right? Depending on uh, what, um, ensemble strategy we used. And in, uh, in almost all cases, we were able to perform better um, than this um, state of the art defense mechanism, uh, which are out there. Um, we got close in this strong attack, um, but that, that was the case for FGSM. Um, and we tested with other attack scenario, BIM, uh, PGD, others, the results um, more or less the same. We also did with black box. In black box, we assume that the attacker doesn't know uh, um, the parameters of the uh, model. What uh, the attacker does is to exploit some input, ask the model, what is the output? Like imagine that you don't know a model, but you should, you, you are able to query the model and get the result. And then you train a substitute model uh, as a result on this uh, input output that you have, you have collected, right? Um, once you construct this substitute model and this substitute model, here we assume that the attacker knows the architecture of the, of the model. Okay, but doesn't know the parameter. Um, so we, we assume a stronger version of the attacker where, uh, where she knows like the architecture of the model. Um, so um, we train a, a classifier using this input output and then we launch attack against this substitute model and use these uh, um, examples uh, to, um, to attack the, the original system, right? So that's a different scenario than the zero knowledge or white box. Um, 
The result was also interesting. Uh, here you see some transferability rate, meaning that um, the how many what was the percentage of the examples uh, adversarial example that was generated on the adversarial on the substitute model were able to trick the system uh, as well. So the higher transferability rate um, actually the worse, right? Because we want to decrease this transferability rate as much as possible. And we noticed that if Athena is in place, so this is the undefended model, this is uh, defended model with Athena, we were able to decrease this adversarial, this transferability rate. And yeah, this was for particular uh, attack, but for other attacks was the result was also same. So not going to talk about each individually. And um, we did two version of black box. We also um, did an experiment with optimization based black box, um, which is a different version. Um, hop, skip, jump is a, uh, very new um, type of um, black box optimization um, with different budgets. Uh, with budgets here in the number of examples that we, we query the system, the original system. Um, and y-axis showing the distance between um, L2 uh, and L infinity uh, norm between uh, the um, original samples and the uh, perturbed sample, specifically uh, under L2 norm, we measured X prime minus X under, for example, L2 in this case. This is what it does. Um, and we show that, uh, we notice that if Athena is in place, the attacker should um, should vary the input more in terms of magnitude uh, when the uh, when the model is not protected by Athena. Um, if you want to see um, what it happens, is that the uh, attacker was able to trick the model with this input but was not able to attack the protected model with this input. She needed to perturb much more the input in order to attack the protected model. And this is also true for, um, come on. Why it is so strong? Yeah, um, and you see for other example, in this case, um, like when the um, antenna is in place, the input need uh, should be perturbed much more in terms of magnitude of noise in order to trick the model. Um, so this has some implication, meaning that um, the attacker should do a, a more difficult task and this has the risk that everybody can see that this input has been perturbed. So it's easy to detect uh, these as adversarial example, right? Uh, we also did some white box uh, with some greedy approaches. Uh, and also, um, oh, one thing to notice is here, we also show that when we um, increase the, um, the, um, the strength of the attack, um, yes, this is obvious that the model uh, test accuracy has been decreased. But one, one thing that was interesting was that we were able to detect this as adversarial example easily with 
higher probability. So after we um, we combine the detector with um, with this antenna, we were able to get good accuracy, meaning that rejecting this as adversarial examples rather than feeding it uh, to the system. And also we showed that like um, if the attacker wants to uh, to be a stronger, they need to pay a higher cost, meaning that uh, they need to spend more time generating this adversarial example. They need to pay higher cost. And for some scenarios, um, this is um, this is very interesting. For example, um, one thing that um, I mean, this uh, framework was uh, came into the interest of Google. Um, they are um, they want to integrate this with their backend system. Um, and one thing that was interesting to them, um, and and by the way, this is something that. Um, we will be working with Google to make this integration happen. This is an exciting opportunity to, to hopefully make some impact uh, in this direction. Um, one thing that was interesting for them was that, yeah, in this case, like whoever wants to attack uh, such real world system, they will eventually give up if they need to pay a higher cost for generating these adversarial examples, right? Um, also, we did some other version of um, white box attacks. I'm not going to talk about detail. Um, um, so I would skip this. Um, also, um, we, we tested the, um, the defense with um, other type of model rather than deep neural network. Um, in this case, we tested with uh, SVM and random forest. And we show that um, the results are more or less similar. Um, so it's not the case that Athena can only protect deep neural network um, due to the architecture of Athena. We, were, we are able to also integrate this with other type of uh, models like SVM um, or random forest uh, protect them as a result. Um, because like we don't assume anything about the backend model or um, the input. Um, so um, these are, that's why um, our approach is generic. But obviously it comes with some cost um, since we need to deploy uh, multiple models uh, at the same time, um, the memory consumption is much higher. Um, but in terms of inference time, um, since these inferences can happen in parallel, um, the, uh, there is no significant difference between the latency uh, as a result unless there is a unusually um, like a crazy transformation. Um, so um, that, uh, that basically requires a um, lot of time, but in that case also, uh, whoever that wants to use the uh, defense could like, could say, okay, let's remove this weak defense because it, um, it takes a lot of time to compute the uh, transformations, right? Um, uh, so, so to summarize, um, is there any question? Yeah, sorry. Uh, for for the different models in the previous slide, is the same data set used? Yes. It, here we use MNIST. Um, I mean, these results are for MNIST, um, but- um, no, I mean, uh, like, the whole data set for all three. In, for example, in bagging, which also is an ensemble model, yes. they use a, a, a variation of each data set um, for each model and then average it. So here uh, are all the examples used for every model trained with the difference being just the type of model. I mean, the type of model, I mean, the, um, the important 
part is not the time that it takes to produce the label, is actually the transformation time that it matters. Because like in almost all cases, the time that it takes to produce the, um, the label is negligible comparing with the transformation time, right? Um, which is common in all cases, no matter what model we use, right? And that's why I did not talk about the specific model here because that's negligible, no matter, negligible with respect to the transformation time, right? Um, no matter what model, whether you use random forest or you use like SVM or you use deep neural network, right? Obviously, trans, uh, inference time between these varies, but comparing with transformation time, all of them are negligible. Does it make sense? Right. Uh, the, uh, I wasn't talking about the inference time. I was talking about, like, let's say if you have seven examples, you use uh, the first four for the first model, use another four for the second model. Uh, does something like that happen? Like, do you um, bootstrap the data? No, for, for, the, uh, for the, if you're talking about the variation of the input, um, I mean, yeah, there are some variants, but like more or less same, right? So like in terms of like when we feed a input, like for example, for uh, time that it takes, um, like this is, let's say, this is time for transforming input more or less same time for like transforming um, like x1 x2 right so this could vary we measure this but like the variance is very small right uh, even for different input uh, data and um, but this variance that you see here are for different transformations. Like for um, like here we have 72 different transformation for MNIST. So you have 72 different numbers for like one of these inputs. And that's why we like, um, even though we measure for all inputs, like we put the data for one of those inputs because the variances are not, um, are negligible. Thank you. Sure. Good question. So Athena is flexible, extensible, general, and uh, comes with uh, moderate overhead, uh, depending how you interpret it. Um, I have to mention that um, we have a website for, for this. All data is also available. Some tutorial is out there. And um, for those of you who are interested in this line of research, uh, shoot me an email. Uh, always looking forward to work with um, good students, uh, especially those who are, um, who are passionate um, doing um, research in this uh, line of research. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity and Thank you for very good questions uh, that you ask. Thanks. The class was looking forward to something like this. Uh, so I hope they got, um, and I hope they got a chance to look at um, your website, which of course was shared with you. Uh, you have shared here also, and you get a lot more, uh, you know, get, get beyond the talk itself. All right, guys, class, uh, we'll um, reconnect. Uh, this is, uh, I guess we limit to our class time, but uh, we'll reconnect uh, online on LinkedIn. Talk to you. Bye. Thanks. Thanks, Amit. Yeah. Bye.